I'll just wait one second for that. We recording. Cool. Thank you very much. You should be able to see. Actually, can you see the uh, learn the learn web development? Is that what yeah. I'm sharing? Excellent. So, um, to cut a long story short, what we ended up doing is creating two learning modules, and the first one is. <laughs> Not on the URL because the sidebar doesn't seem to be updated. Understanding client side web development tools. I actually approached Remy Sharp to write this because I thought he knows that stuff pretty well and I know him fairly well and he would probably do a good job of writing that. So I'm not going to go through every one of these in great detail, but you know, we have client side tooling overview which sort of takes you through you know what are all of the different classifications of tool that you might use we 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 split it into um um safety net as remy calls it or, or basically you know tools that help you to code more efficiently and more effectively um the second top kind of classification we have is transformation tools so things like build tools Pre processes all of that kind of stuff and then thirdly we have um, post coding tools including things like deployment and testing so um, we don't go through every tool available but we give a few examples and give a good idea in general of what those classifications of tools do um, the second one we have there as you can see is command line crash course because you know, the command line is pretty much essential if you're going to be using a lot of this client side tooling, but it's just kind of something that in a lot of courses you see about web stuff these days, they all seem to just assume that you know the command line, whereas a lot of young folk coming up into this industry probably don't so much. So that's real basics of command line. Um, package management, basically, you know, how to use NPM and Yarn to do interesting things, what the point of package managers is, et cetera, et cetera how to use one at a basic level. Um, and then we introduce a complete tool chain, um, which basically provides a very, very simple um, React app. It uses post CSS to use a couple of features that aren't actually in the browser yet. Um, it uses parcel to do the build. It uses um, ESLint and Prettify to do a couple of useful kind of code caring type things and then we use github to send it up to a repo and then we deploy that onto a netlify instance so it's just like a nice sort of simple well i say simple <laughs> it doesn't seem that simple to me but um it's a nice simple kind of ten thousand foot walkthrough of the sort of stuff that you should be able to do with web tools um and i'm kind of thinking well let's keep it relatively generic and not and include as little as possible stuff about the actual tools so that it'll be simpler to uh, keep maintained and keep actually working so that was that um, then I was very quickly going to introduce you to the other bit that I've got available which is the framework section so understanding client-side JavaScript frameworks so again, JavaScript frameworks is such a big deal these days that I thought, well, this probably deserves several modules, but I thought, well, let's just produce one module to begin with, just to kind of dip our toes in the water and say, you know, let's see how successful this is and then what people ask for later, and then we can always add more later on. So the idea here was, um, I've got a couple of introductory guides that kind of say, okay, as, an aspiring web developer who probably knows a bit of vanilla JavaScript, why bother to learn frameworks on top of that? How do, how do they relate to vanilla JavaScript? Um, why do they exist? What problems do they actually solve um, that modern apps require and the, and the native platform has a bit of trouble with sometimes? Uh, what general kind of features do all frameworks tend to have and how do they all work together? Um, when should you use a framework? When should you not use a framework, which is another important thing that you know you don't really get with a lot of framework vendors documentation. It's just basically our framework is great, so use it for everything. This is wonderful kind of thing. 
I know that they're not all like that, but a lot of them tend to. So I want to provide, you know, as neutral a view as possible that kind of says, you know, let's step back a bit and ask why or when you'd even use this stuff. So with those bits out of the way in the first two articles there, I then provide, I originally intended this to be a fairly simple um, kind of walkthrough of the real basics for each framework in like an article or so, but I very quickly realized that frameworks do so much and are so complicated that you can't really explain even the basics just in a single um, article. So we ended up with quite a few articles about React covering all the main sort of parts. Um, we covered Ember as well, because that still seems to be um, fairly popular. Covered Vue, because Vue is really cool and it seems to be up and coming. Uh, we also wanted to cover Angular, because I think from the last time I looked at the stats, Angular seems to be the sort of the second most used framework still after React, but I couldn't, well, I had a few author snafus and authors dropping out, and in the end, I just ran out of time. But we want to, we want to cover React later on, and then after I publish this stuff, um, uh, Sebastian Scurano approached me and said he'd love to provide a course about Svelte basics. So we should have a Svelte series coming very soon, which I'm really pleased about because. That's what I always wanted. I didn't just want to cover the really big ones, even though it sort of makes sense to cover the biggest ones that are in the most demand. Um, but I also thought, well, let's cover a smaller, more up and coming one just to kind of, you know, give a little bit of fairness to the smaller, the smaller frameworks. Um, and something, I mean, I've already had a bit of abuse about this online, which is inevitable, but um, I have included this big section here, which is which frameworks did we choose because I kind of thought, well, it's difficult, but whenever, um, I'll just stop sharing for a second, but when, whenever we cover anything that's not pure web technologies and MDN, we tend to get abuse because it's like MDN is supposed to be the neutral place to go and learn about web standards and how dare you cover React and stuff. Are you just a Facebook shill? Ra 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 ra. Uh, we have got a little bit of that kind of rhetoric, but most people have been quite pleased with our stuff. Um, as I say, I, I have tried to explain the narrative to kind of say, you know, we're not being, a lot of people said, well, are you being sponsored by React and Vue and Ember to cover their frameworks on your side? And it's like, well, no, I literally just wanted to choose a variety of a few frameworks so that beginners had a place to at least start. Because of course, you know, it's all well and good explaining generally what framework features do, but really you can't learn about them without showing a specific example. And for that, you have to show a specific framework. So. So yeah, um, that's kind of the first part of my talk done. And the reason that I was referring to the, um, the issue where I um, delivered my talk information is basically that there's a bit there that says to solicit feedback, you can either fill in a questionnaire or write some free form feedback on a Google Doc link I provided, or you can tweet me and email me. So. Um, if there's any feedback you have about this stuff after the session that you forgot to mention, uh, then feel free to put it in one of those places. But I don't know, um, did any of you folks have any questions about this stuff or any feedback to share immediately? Well, yeah, sure. <laughs> it's, it's fine if you don't, because I mean, this is quite a lot to throw at somebody and say, tell me what you think, but uh, please, please yeah. go ahead if you have some feedback. Um, well, the question that is always on my mind is how to make use of this. And uh, the thing that I always notice when I have to use MDN is that I have to leave the, the IDE that I'm in. And I know that there are some plugins for VS Code, um, but, uh, you know, uh, I'm a decentralization developer and I was wondering if there's like a, you know, a, a clear copy of MDN that can be downloaded. Uh, so it is just with my, uh, with my, uh, yeah, Visual Studio code or something like that. And I can just reference to it. And it would uh, like, first, of course, you would need a version of this. Like you would need versioning and uh, a, a distribution method for this. But also, um, what's more important is like, I would like to see in an IDE 
that if I have this JavaScript method and this is a promise, like uh, if in TypeScript there is a promise popping up that I could see more information about the you know in depth documentation or articles around it immediately while I'm, I'm editing without the round trip to the browser. Right, no, that is that is a very good bit of feedback, and it's not the first time I've heard it. And I do have some kind of interesting news on both fronts, really. So the first, really, it's kind of being unpacked. I can unpack this into two questions, really. The first one is, you know, can we have an offline version of MDN available to use so that we don't have to keep loading it up in the browser? And the second one, really, what you're saying is, is there some way that I can have kind of MDN information popping up? inside my ID so I don't even have to leave it. I think that's both points pretty much covered, isn't it? Um, so for the first one, we have been asked about whether we can have an offline MDN a few times before. And I suppose my first question is kind of, would it be good enough to have it to just do some sort of simple service worker thing where we can just make all of the pages available offline? I'm guessing not because that would still involve going to the web browser. And secondly, what kind of, format would you prefer to have it in? What would be most useful in that regard? Um, since the formatting is in HTML, uh, at least the content wouldn't be, need to be in HTML, but it should be uh, semantic. In a, I'm not sure uh, if it is feasible in Visual Studio Code to just pop up an iframe and you know uh, drop the resources in a stat. I'm also not sure how um, Resize properties work. You know, if it if you have the do documentation in the sidebar of right. the ID, the the layout should work for that. Um, so there might it might be a good idea to have a, a semi semantic version or like a, an advanced HTML mode where you can maybe pass in, you know, through the hash parameter of the HTML site, you can pass in some visualization uh, hints where you can say like, okay, please use this in dark mode now or in a, more importantly, uh, like broad information or thin information mode, something like that. Yeah. Um, I, I would not be looking for a completely devoid of uh, branding thing. So I would be okay with branding. I would be okay with the Mozilla logo being in there and stuff like that. That would be fine. Um, it's just the deep linking is important, you know, like that I can inside the code like deep link and, and see. Uh, like one example for how it would be cool in the ID, you know, like I'm, I'm dreaming here, but uh, if I have the MDN site for promises open, that it shows me all the places in my project where I have promises, you know, like <laughs> this automatic connection, where in my code is this, and, and, and how does it relate to the things that are here? Sure. Um, so I have even better news kind of on that front. So just this week, I saw what one one of the MDN developers, um, Gregor, who's based in our Berlin office, um, was playing around with an idea of being able to just pull, you know, pull up MDN data kind of anywhere. You know, the the, the ultimate idea that he's working on is, could we pre present all of the MDN content as basically like a query? queryable API so you can just bring it up anywhere that you can access it. That's ultimately what, what we want to aim for. Now, at the moment, that would be a bit painful because all of the MDN data is contained in a MySQL database and all of the MDN content, should I say. So it's not really structured content. It's just big blobs of stuff inside MySQL. Um, so at the moment, we'd probably have to do some kind of scraping of the pages as we queried, and I'm not sure how yeah, the performance would be on that. I suspect probably it wouldn't be great, and there'd be a lot of troubles of doing that. But I mean, he is investigating that to start off with. Now, the good bit of news is uh, around the corner is coming probably end of this year, start of next year. Um, we're gonna have MDN available in a GitHub repo. Um, we're moving out of the MySQL database and we're aiming to represent the content in a GitHub repo. Initially, that would be HTML files. Um, of course, if it's just flat files and sat there available like that, it might be a bit easier to query. But what we're ultimately aiming to do is we're aiming to turn it into structured markdown. Um, uh, for, uh, some like three members of my team are already working on writing the schemas, writing the recipes, writing a linter to lint all of the content pages 
um, you know, fixing the errors to make sure that all of the pages are totally consistent. And then when we turn it into the markdown content, um, plus metadata to actually organize the content, this is the point when we should be able to start doing this a lot more easily. So it's a little way off perhaps, but we're already looking into this. We, we've, we've already come, come into contact with this whole idea. Wouldn't it be great if you could just query all of MDN's content as structured data and just pull it up where you need it? So that's what we're aiming towards. And then of course, at that point, if we could get it into that state, um, anybody could just write plugins for their favorite IDEs using it or web extensions or whatever they want. So that's kind of where we're going with that. As a developer of my own modules or things, um, I need to invent the wheel, reinvent the wheel when it comes to documentation. And um, if MDN would manage it to, you know, like have a big fancy collaboration with TypeScript, uh, <laughs> that would kind of lead the way towards other tools also being able to use the same documentation concept uh, in theirs. So let's say if the MDN would provide a, a general purpose, you know, surface layer for, for documentation, for advanced documentation for things, uh, or additional documentation of things, like uh, conceptually speaking, for me, MDN is, you have uh, a concept of, of, of a promise, and yes, a promise can be explained very briefly as a, as a very uh, easy sort of thing, but it adds this facets to the documentation it gives more information it gives more it, it, it explains it well there are some nice examples and stuff like that so it's like mm -hmm. uh, you have this uh, raw documentation that is usually coming from the developer and you have an additional layer of documentation that come can come on top of it and that is true for pretty much any project doesn't matter what like if you're writing code you, you the developer might do the, the initial uh, bit of documentation and somebody might do an a, 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 a top of bit uh, um, you know, an additional layer on top of it. And if there would be like a, a, a means how I could write just, or how I gi could give this on top of bit of information freely to the community, that they have a platform to write these sort of things for my tools, uh, that would be cool. Yeah, I mean, that would be amazing. Like we, all of the stuff that we provide is generally under permissive licenses um, and we'd like to give it all back at the end of the day. So if we could provide that sort of layer made generic enough so that it could be used for any docs project, that would be brilliant. I mean, I'm, I'm probably going to go back to our developers and share this with them to give them a bit of an idea of kind of how much further we could go with it, you know, that would be absolutely great. So I, I do really appreciate the, uh, the thoughts on that. Um, yeah, and we'll definitely be in touch when we figure out some more in that direction. Okay, so cool. yeah. thank, you. thank you for that, Martin. Um, so, people have questions. I have more. <laughs> well, yeah, what I was thinking is um, we only have about five minutes left, and I think we need to rush on to another. Um, I, I, I think there's another call going on after that, but I mean, I don't really have time to discuss now the second bit of what, what I was going to discuss. So, let's go on to a couple more questions and fill up the rest of the time that way. So uh, do you want to give me another one? Oh, sure. Um, OK. Um, the other question that I had is about translation. Um, I have a deep interest in translation, and I have worked at a project that does a lot of translation. Uh, so um, just brief background on me. I, I was a big organizer at Node School, uh, where we did the tutorials for Node. And they were translated in many languages as well, not as many as MDM. But we were struggling with this concept of um, there is code in our documentation that should be equal in all uh, in all languages, and there is text in those documentation that is not equal. Like um, we have updates to our tools where we say like, okay, we need to update the, the the code example. It's broken, and then all the translations would need an update. But if there is only like a, a uh, 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 informal piece of text wrong, or it explains it different, you know, like badly in one language and well in another language, and we only need to update that language. So there's some uh, responsibility that is only for, let's say, the Japanese speaker, and there's something that is more general. And uh, I was wondering how you figured out 
to make this process like smooth. Like if you notice that there is an update in code that affects all the translations that you like get to let them know that it works. And if there is like, a, you know, like, um, a kind of like, if you want to get uh, the Mozilla docs to be broadly used by React frameworks or other frameworks, giving this sort of guide would help them to do it right. And you obviously know how to do this. So is there a document around this or? Um, so the answer I'm gonna give you here is probably gonna be quite disappointing, really. I mean, yes, we do do translations, but what I find is, I mean, in, in terms of purely the technical problem that you're discussing, what we tend to do is um, we just have the English version written first, and then we offer the service where if you want to create a translation of that, you click on the languages drop down, you click add a new translation, you select the language that you want to do the translation of, and then it gives you a, and then it gives you like a little side by side view where it shows you the English and then lets you type in your translation to the right of that. So it's really basic. It's not very clever at all, unfortunately. And the code is just provided as is inside the tra translated document. And there's nothing to stop the translator translating the code examples if they want to. It's not, I mean, again, what we're moving towards is we're moving towards more examples being contained in a central repository. So if you look at, for example, our interactive examples, which is the little editable examples that you see at the top of all of the JavaScript reference pages these days, they're all contained in a GitHub repo and generated when the static pages are generated. Um, so they're kept they're, 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 they're kept consistent regardless of the language. Um, and then we have some others too, but it's by no means consistent yet. This is another huge problem. The, the main problem that we have is we don't really have any management structure that does the translations properly. So we have really good French translations, for example, but that's totally down to the community having some really passionate members that keep those up to date as much as possible. But a lot of our translations are woefully out of date and we don't have any staff who even look at them these days. So this is something that we badly, badly need to improve on because at the moment it's really like we kind of pretend to do translations, but we don't really, and it's very sad. Um, one of the things I'm starting up with a few of my colleagues is um, I'm doing a research project at the moment to kind of look like, as, as I mentioned earlier, we're moving towards this MDN as structured data in GitHub. Um, and we're current do, currently doing a project where we're researching what would the best way, what would be the best way to do localization in that new world of MDN. Um, so I'm afraid I haven't really got a better answer for you at the moment. It's something we badly need to improve on. Um, yeah, maybe. Like if you know, like if you're halfway up the mountain, you still see the rest of the top. But if you're at the bottom. Anybody who is half up the mountain knows a lot more than you do. <laughs> I, guess, I guess it's just, I mean, what ideally what I'd like to do is I'd like to employ like a community manager for each locale and get them to handle the community that would help with that and keep it moving. But we just don't have the staff for that at the moment. It's a real shame. And yeah, I don't know. We, um, but yeah, I mean, if, if, if you want some more information about localization, I mean, we're pretty much out of time now, but my, my email address is on the, uh, is on the open JS foundation issue. So feel free to drop me a line about this and the other things we've talked about. And that goes for anybody else as well. Um, feel free to throw more questions at me offline or tweet me about them or fill fill, fill your feedback in on the doc I provided. So, um, I, I will fill out the form. I have brilliant. to go on too. <laughs> Thank you for your time. Cool. Yeah. Uh, thank you very much, folks, for coming. And uh, yeah, I do appreciate you attending. And uh, I shall hopefully see you soon somewhere on the web. Yep. Thank you, Chris. Thank you. All thank right. You. Thanks a lot. Thanks for having me. Bye.